prayer. A round of applause for him as he comes forward. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you this morning. Take all the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you for making this day to be a reality. Thank you for the organizers of this event. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for Landmark University. Thank you for malignant. Father, take all the glory in the mighty name of Jesus. We commit this event onto your hebo hand. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Take absolute and perfect preeminence in the mighty name of Jesus. Everything that we shall be doing here this morning, Father, let it be to your own glory and to the advancement of this institution in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. Take out the glory. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Thank you very much, sir. Please, may we remain standing as we take the university anthem. The studio, please. Thank you very much. You may all please be seated as at this juncture, permit me to roll out the protocol. I'd like to recognize the presence of the Vice Chancellor, Landmark University, Professor Charity Aremo, the Registrar, Landmark University, Ms. Funke Fola Oyiloye. I'd also like to appreciate our guest facilitator for this webinar in person of Barrister Oluwashe Yeti Adeboye Esquire. I'd like to also recognize all the dean and the Dean School of Postgraduate Studies, all the deans of colleges, dean student affairs, heads of academic departments, all the HODs. I'd like to also recognize the professorate the chaplain, the chaplain, Landmark University, all academic and non-academic directors, members of faculty and staff, ladies and gentlemen, as well as all our kings and queens present here this morning. You are most welcome. At this juncture, I'd like to invite the director for Landmark University Center for Research, Innovation and Discovery, Lucrid, Dr. Adeolu Adesoji Adediron for the prologue of the webinar. A round of applause for him as he comes forward, please. Thank you, they help me. The Vice Chancellor Ma, permit me to adopt earlier established protocol as I take on this assignment. We are thankful to God and the proprietor base 
for according us this platform to showcase and share thoughts from prolific and seasoned practitioners in various fields of endeavors through the auspices of the Lamarck University Center for Research, Innovations, and Discoveries. In fact, we are glad this day that Barrister Huluashi Yadoboye Esquire has graciously accepted to be a facilitator in the 19th Lucre webinar that is entitled Informal Means of Social Control and Present Day Nigerian Security Challenges. I want to kindly request that we all sit tight as the facilitator will do justice to the topic. I want to, on this note, congratulate the SDG 16 team lead, Mr. Jakai, and other team members of this SDG. Also the department, as well as the college at large. I want to say a big thank you to everyone for coming. A round of applause again for the team director, Luke Reed. At this juncture, permit me to welcome the coordinator for SDG 16, Mr. Olari Waju Ajakai, for the welcome address. Mr. Ajakai, please. A round of applause for him as he comes forward. Thank you very much. The Vice Chancellor, Ma, permit me to stand on already established protocol for this event. I want to first appreciate God for this opportunity to be here. I want to thank our facilitator for today, Barista Luashe Yadi Boye, for making our time despite his uh, busy schedule. Today, I want to totally agree with the Chancellor, Dr. David Oedipo, who stated that there's no mountain anywhere. Every man's mountain is his ignorance. The challenges of security before our nation is not new. So as is common to all nations in the world. But the challenge is we've not been able to identify other means of resolving the security issue. You know, um, we have problems, we have challenges, but how do we go about resolving them? That is what matters most. And that's why we're here to seek answers to the security challenges before in our nation. Section 14, subsection 2 of the 1999 Constitution as amended stated that. The welfare and security of people shall be the primary responsibility of our government. If the government will not lead us in this direction, we need to look for alternative means. Section 305, subsection one and two, also stated the reasons the government can declare a state of emergency, the reasons are before us, and yet the government is here to do anything about it. So if the government is afraid to declare a state of emergency, that means the former means of social control is indeed not workable. And today we are looking at uh, informal means of uh, social control as a way of tackling these great challenges because the former control has indeed failed us and we need to look for alternative. I want to state clear that section 33 verse subsection one of the constitution also state that security, uh, every man has right to life and nobody's life can be taken without any cause. And in this order, we need to value Nigerian life. And how do we get this social control we talk about? We talk about the family system, which is agent of socialization. If the families that we have in this 21st century, they are, they are failing. And we need to bring to fore these issues and make it uh, more appropriate. And on this note, I would like to judge each and every one of us to pay attention to what we taught here today as it will help us going forward as a nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. May I invite Dr. Adediron for the next assignment. A round of applause for him, please. Thank you, dear me. Uh, without wasting much of our time, we'll move close to the next item. I want to kindly give our indulgence to rise as I bring on stage. The Acting Vice Chancellor, Professor Haremun, as she performs the next assignment. Please, may we be seated. This morning, 
we are here again in fulfillment of our vision mandate. Attaining the global relevance, it's all about doing what you must do for time. Engaging intentionally, engaging with adequate focus so as to attain your goal. Yes, like the um, Dr. Ajakaye, or rather, the facilitator of today's webinar has presented to us. Every nation that must advance must start with the security level. Nigeria today, as we speak, is under four keywords, which has formed an acronym called VUCA. That is where we are today, no doubt about that. Why do I say this? Everything around us is so volatile. That's the first V. Why do I say this? Everything around us today looks uncertain. We live in an uncertain Nigeria. Anything can happen anytime. As we are seated, God forbid, you may begin to hear, do not go to Ilori today. Something is happening. Maybe the Boko Haram, maybe the kidnappers, maybe one mayhem or the other happening around us. That's where we are today as a country. And then they see, talking about complexities, because we live in a volatile environment, uncertainties everywhere, it becomes so complex. You can't even define the state of the nation for time. And that's what makes it complex. And then if it is complex, then it becomes ambiguous. Something you cannot really separate. Something that sounds not clear. You want to begin to find time to tease them out. It's like having a tangled wool. How do you begin to separate them and be able to define the length? That's ambiguous. So that's why today, if Nigeria is living in an ambiguous, uncertain, complex, and volatile world, what is the way forward? And so this morning, we want to say, informal means of social control, how do we look at this informal means of social control? No wonder we have a facilitator in our midst. So quickly, please, CSIS. Like the usual protocol that we give us, the earlier speakers has rolled out the protocols. All I need to do is to build or emphasize on it. Thank God for the proprietor-based platform. We had a good news early hours of today. And the news came officially around 9, 10 p.m. that Landmark University has entered into the world-class university across the globe. Now, how did this happen? It was all intentional. By Impact Times Higher Education Ranking. It all started from this room. And so I, want to, I said, Tuesday we'll be celebrating this, but this is just by the way. It all started with one man, the Chancellor Lamarck University, and then the pro-Chancellor Lamarck University giving us the privilege, giving us the workable ambience, which we call the life applicable environment, life training applicable environment to work in. And one of such is this webinar holding today. Not all universities can connect to the whole globe like we are. The facilitator for today is not from here. Neither is he within around here. But we are connecting globally because of the life applicable teaching ambience provided us. The Zoom link is not free. What we use to connect to the whole world, our database is not free. We engage with uh, MTN and Globe so as to subscribe and be able to reach out to the whole world. I cannot stand here to tell us the millions the proprietor base spend every year to ensure that we connect. And so that's why we're able to do all of these things. So moving forward, 
Therefore, on behalf of the Chancellor of the Proprietor Base, I welcome us to the 19th new grade of Landmark University. And I know it is one of those moments we are looking for so as to soar high. To God alone be all the glory. Yes, like I said, a lot of challenges are ravaging Nigeria. The terrorism, sometimes last two weeks or three weeks or about a month now, the pains, the parents, mothers, children, loved ones are bearing due to the, late, the last um, attack on the railway at Kaduna is still all over the place. And that is not the last. And neither will it be the least. That's where we are as a country. So we have terrorism, Boko Haram, insurgencies, economic melt, everything started with economic meltdown. I should be able to explain on this much later. Therefore, we need a good knowledge on going how to attack and address all of this. We need to see how to provide solution. And that is one of the goals of the university. Our aim is to teach, to research and impact the community. How are we doing this? How are we addressing the insecurity all over the place? At this point, one of our strong relationships, well, of course, it can be formal or informal. No man can perform beyond the level of information he or she has to his or her disposal. It's what you know that you can give. What you don't know, what you don't have, you cannot give. And so today we want to look at the efficacy of informal means of addressing the social menace around us. How do we solve the problem, the present insecurity challenges in Nigeria? And so that is why we want to say that um, wars all over the place. The use of drones, you students, you can design. Because our climate, even the climate change challenges is also staring on our faces. We need intelligent surveillance in within our environment. Even just look at landmark alone. Don't look beyond. How do we address all of this? And so we want to say, okay, before we can begin to address the problem, what are the causes of this problem? Number one, like I said, economic meltdown is number one. I tell you, many families do not have, cannot survive on one dollar. I mean, many families cannot even have one dollar. A day. And that is looking at income per capita or per capita income. What do you call it? No many, um, we thank God for the privileges you and I have. We can say, oh, I spend more than 600 naira because a dollar is about 600 naira now. Somebody said 590 or so or 585. Between 580 and 600, that's where we are with dollar as we speak. But how many individuals can get 600 naira a day? How many, sir? How many? How many individuals can make boast of 600 naira a day? Thank God for you and I. That is the problem we have in Nigeria. And then coupled with bad governance, all of these things has heralded poverty. Then poverty has heralded terrorism. Weak judicial system. Somebody, you know, try to extract the corruption level. When someone that dragged away or packed away um, the money meant for, what do they call it, it pensioners or something? And you still put the person in charge. And I think that they said one of such persons has been appointed to be the secretary general or something of a committee looking into corruption. For God's sake, what are we saying concerning our nation, Nigeria? Unemployment, when a youth graduates today, how do they get a job? And anyone that is not gainfully employed, we find something to do. So what, do, what is the way forward? There are clashes all over. Ethnic groups are also gathering. Don't come to my land. This land belongs to Aja Koju community. No, you have trespassed beyond your boundary. That is part of the challenges we have today. And then before you know it, war all over the place. 
How do we develop? How do we get visionary? How do we know what to do? And so we want to say that good governance, is it a mirage? Economic development, is it a mirage? Having quality leadership, is it a mirage? Then looking at our borders and security, is it a mirage? And so please, ladies and gentlemen, no any other time but now to begin to look at how do we address the solutions in Nigeria so as to begin to be secured on how to move. We need to train ourselves, get well informed on how to secure yourself in your living environment. This is the essence of this webinar this morning. And I want to say that no doubt we have the right facilitator with us today who will help out in teasing out the rubric, the rubrics that we all need in advancing the security challenges, turning all the challenges, all the fears, all the concerns about security into solutions. And so that is the essence of this webinar this morning. Without much ado, I want to congratulate the College of Business and Social Sciences for coming up with the 19th webinar series, where we are looking at um, um, SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. And so we appreciate the role the College of Business and Social Sciences is playing. This is their second webinar in the last two months. And specifically now, the Department of um, Political Science, Interrail, and Mass Communications. You have all done well. Can we put our hands together for the department and the college? Now, the title of today's or the theme of today's webinar is Informal Means of social control and present day Nigerian security challenges. Informal means of social control and present day Nigerian security challenges. And no any other person will be doing justice to this than our own barrister. He's a legal practitioner, a legal luminary. I know I will not be able to talk much because his citation will be shortly read. Barista Uluwa Shaye Adebayo Esquire. He's ready. In fact, I tried to follow through. He was online a few minutes, about 10 minutes to 11. He already has joined. And so I want to appreciate you, our dear barista. Are we already online? Are we already? Is he hearing us? OK, I think we should bring him up. And so I want to appreciate you, our dear barista for being part of us today. And we know all that you'll be rolling out will equip us in the area of security. Everyone I say, please get your pens ready or your notepad as you take down the notes because you will end something today. You will glean from his presentation this morning to better your preparedness for a secured self and a secured environment. God bless you and welcome to Landmark University 19th Look Read webinar series. Thank you. A round of applause again for our articulate, vivacious, ebullient Vice Chancellor. Thank you very much. You may please be seated. You may be confused as to whether is she in political science? Is she in uh, sociology? She is an agrarian par excellence. It's just that she's a woman of many parts. And then she has been able to sufficiently set the ball rolling for this webinar. And I guess all of you are looking forward and you are excited to hear the guest facilitator we have for today. But before we bring him on, I'd like to call on Mr. Obudele Ino Oluwashio to take the citation of the guest facilitator. A round of applause for him as he comes forward, please. Thank you. The, the Vice-Chancellor, Vice 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 Ma, permit me 
to adopt the already established protocol. Uh, may I request, as I read the citation of our distinguished speaker today, may I request that he rise or Okay. Thompson Adebayi, our distinguished speaker today, was born into the family of evangelists and Mrs. Adebayi in the late 80s as a third of eight children. He attended Ebenezer Mosque and Primary School and Union Baptist Grammar School in Lowry for his primary and secondary school education, respectively. He proceeded to the University of Ilori for his LLB degree throughout his university days. Throughout his university days, hello. Throughout his university days, he was the best in his class earning the reputation of the university scholar and culminating in his enjoyment of free tuition and free accommodation at the university. He graduated with a second class upper division as the best graduating student in the Department of Common Law and Faculty of Law. Please be able to have a round of applause for our facilitator. He proceeded to the Nigerian Law School, Lagos Campus, where he graduated with a first class degree and came out as the second best graduating student in Nigeria for the academic session. He bagged a master's degree, LLM, from the University of Ilori and is currently undergoing his PhD program in the same institution. He started his legal practice with the law firm of Mesas Kayode Olatuke San and Co, where he rose to become the head of Chambers litigation session. Sheye has participated actively in over 20 election petitions, including the popular Atiku versus Buari, Isi Iyamu versus Ainek, Oke versus Mimiko, Adeyemi versus Melaye and many others. His range of parties and experience are banking and corporate disputes, among others. After a decade with Mrs. Kayode Olatuke San, Sheye has set up his law firm, Sheye Thompson and Attorneys, located in the heart of Ilori, with a practice area covering the case aspect of the law. To interest you to know that our distinguished facilitator today is happily married to a lawyer, barrister Deborah Adeboye, and they are blessed with two children. At this junction, may I request that we rise and to join me to welcome barrister Oluwaseye Tomsi Adeboye Esk Choir for his presentation. Your answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the honor given to me. Thank you very much. Um, the Vice Chancellor Ma, and um, permit me to stand on the established protocol. Uh, I really want to thank God for the opportunity given to me to, to speak at this webinar. Can you hear me, please? Thank you. I really want to appreciate God for the opportunity to give me, uh, he has given me rather, to speak at this um, webinar. And I also want to appreciate the organizers of this um, wonderful webinar for bringing me on board. Um, one mistake most organizers have made over the years is to bring up programs that are not relevant to present day realities. But this is not the case here. I don't think there's a, a, a more important uh, discussion anybody can have in any part of this country 
um, which would um, go beyond um, the security challenges we all face. And the truth of the matter is that uh, nobody is safe as far as this country is concerned. Um, to underscore what I'm trying to say, I had the fortunes of um, having a matter in the Cardinal Court of Appeal um, early this year. And I did um, Abuja to Karuna. I was talking to my client. We did the transport together. I told him that that was perhaps the safest transport now. Because per coach, we had four mobile police on every coach. So it seemed to me that was the safest um, transport, uh, mobile, uh, the transport we could have in this country. But we all know that in the past few weeks, we have all been inundated with news showing that um, that train was attacked, going to show that nowhere is safe in this country. So I really want to thank the, uh, the, organiz the organizers of this, um, of this discourse, of this lecture, for bringing this topic at this point in time. I really want to appreciate you. Now, going straight to the crux of the matter, security challenges are on the rise every day. Every day, I don't think there's any time we'll go through our newspapers or listen to news without list, um, hearing news of something having happened somewhere and um, something having not happened somewhere. It has gotten so worse that while we focus on the major security challenges that we have, the Boko Haram, the bandits, the kidnappers, and there's, there has been on the rise a particular um, social vice that is staring at us in the face. I don't know if we saw what happened in Abel Uta recently, where boys of um, 17 or 18 year olds went on to behead a girl. Because, um, can you hear me, please? Where boys of 17 and 18 year olds beheaded a girl because they wanted to do money rituals. I began to ask myself a 17 year old boy, an 18 year old boy trying to. Uh, thinking of doing money rituals, it has only gone on to show the extent of decay this country has seen. It has only gone on to show the amount of decadence we have seen as a country. In Ilori here, we all heard about the Ilori rape, where six or so boys, 18, 19 year olds, raped a girl to death. So, in as much as we have security challenges staring at us in the face in the country, we should not also rule out the fact that another menace that is eating deep into this country is the fact that we have moral decadence. We have um, moral decadence, we have crimes, even coming happening at our doorsteps. We go to show that um, security challenges in this country should be given priority. I hope we are together, please. We have to underscore, underscore the fact that the the first duty of every sane government all over the world is to protect lives and properties. That is the first duty of every government all over the world. It is to protect the lives and properties of its citizens. But the Nigerian government, the Nigerian constitution, we have a quite peculiar one. The, um, the, organizer, the organizer, while giving his welcome speech, alluded Thank you. So, thank you. Like I have been saying, Nigeria has quite a lot of um, security challenges. And um, the point is, the truth is, huge resources are committed to it, to no avail. But then, the problem about battling security or combating security in this country is not only what we have on the face of it. Our laws do not support an ideal way of combating security. When the organizer was talking about the fact that section 14 of the constitution provides for, um, um, uh, makes a provision relating to the need for government to protect lives and properties. That particular section and similar sections 
fall under what we call chapter two of the constitution. Fundamental objectives and directive principles, policies of the constitution. And by virtue of section six of C, sub D, uh, section six of six, sub D of the same constitution, these particular provisions of the constitution are not justiciable. And what do I mean by justiciable? An average citizen cannot approach the court to force the court, uh, to force the government to protect lives and properties. An average citizen cannot go to court to force the government to provide um, uh, what's it, social amenities. So these provisions are cosmetic. They are cosmetic as we can as we have them in the constitution. The constitution has said the government should protect lives and properties. It has also gone on to say that it should. Um, provide social amenities, should provide health facilities, should provide equal employment opportunities, equal educational opportunities. But all these sections of the constitution, as plausible as they are, they cannot be enforced in the court of law. That is the essence of section six of C of the constitution. They cannot be enforced in the court of law. So we have quite a lot of security challenges, which we as citizens cannot approach the court to say, okay, um, court, compel the president to declare a state of emergency in this regard, compel the president to do this, to do that. That is the state at which we are in this country. So it only goes on to show that the formal means of social control and prevention of crime have failed. Punishing people for crimes, punishing them, incarcerating them, they have all failed. I'll give an instance. My church pastor in Ilorin, his house was both good while he was away. He was out of town, his house was boggled. But luckily for him, the, the thief was caught at the scene of the crime. While he was trying to boggle the house, the, the vigilantes and the private securities caught him at the scene of the crime. So he was arraigned, he was taken to court. I, I had to go to court to see what was happening. It was during the course of his prosecution that we discovered that it was just part of those the government had given state pardon two months before um, he went to commit that new offense. I hope we are together. This was somebody that was convicted of an offense in 1991. He was convicted of an offense in 1991. He was in prison from 1991 to 2014 or 15. Then the government thought, okay, he was he had learned his lessons. He, he, he was doing fine. He was ready to be eased back into the system. He got back to the system two months after. He went for another robbery and he was arrested at the scene of the crime. It only shows that the arrest, the initial arrest and prosecution had not attained, had not achieved the desired results. So which only goes on to show further that the formal means of social control and prevention of crimes in Nigeria have seemingly failed. I don't know if I, if I can move on. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. In the same vein, the fact that we have persons, the fact that the, the prosecution of an Evans, the kidnapper, was brought to the fore, the fact that we have seen people being convicted of different um, forms of crime in the country has not reduced uh, the spate of crimes in the country. The fact that EFCC parades people every day that, okay, we have, uh, we have paraded internet forces. 40 of them have been arrested. They have all been convicted. I've not stopped the menace of internet fraud, which will only give credence to the fact that the formal means of social control and prevention of crime have failed as far as this country is concerned. Now, what is crime? Perhaps if you understand um, the formal means of social control and, how, and what crime is, it will give us a good um, insight into how to achieve um, the desired results. Crime has been defined as an illegal act for which someone can be punished by the government. It goes on to show that a crime is not committed against the individual, so to speak. If I have committed a crime against, say, Landmark University, the crime is deemed as having been committed against the government, against the state. That's why most crimes are found to, as seen, most um, prosecution of crimes in Nigeria, as the nomenclature given to them as state against A, the, uh, the, um, the people of Kwara State, against B, the Federal Republic of Nigeria against C, because every crime committed, despite, despite the fact that Mrs. A's house was boggled, does not mean that Mrs. A will be the one to prosecute the crime herself. It is the state that takes it upon itself.
to prosecute the crime for you. So it is seen as being punished by the government. Section two of the criminal code defines a crime or an offense as an act of omission, which is rendered punishable by some legislative enactments. We have varying degrees of enactments, varying degrees of law in Nigeria. I often laugh, it's usually a mistake for people to think that all our laws in this country are contained in the constitution. No, the constitution is just the ground norm, it's a blanket law, which enables other law, other laws rather, to come into effect. So in Nigeria, we have the penal code, we have the EFCC Act, we have the criminal code, we have um, the ICPC Act, we have varying degrees of laws that can prescribe um, certain acts as offenses. Now, I have said it earlier that crimes are committed against the state. Section 36 of uh, sub 12 of the constitution states that a crime is only one when it has been made so by a valid law. The implication of this is that if, a, if an act has not been adjudged to be a crime, it is not so until a law says it is a crime. The best example I will give to you is internet um, uh, cyber crimes. Nigeria, quite unfortunately, we are always behind in all issues. Until when the menace of cyber crime began to stare at us in the face, until when we began to see internet frustrations on the uh, frustrations on the rise, until when we began to have international embarrassment, that was when the legis legislature woke up one day and decided to create the Cyber Crimes Act as we have it today. Then the only punishment that they could give to somebody who had committed internet fraud was uh, advanced fee fraud, which did not properly define cyber crimes as an offense. Now, what we are trying to say is this, that an offense is only one when it has been prescribed by the state as one. So until and unless a, a, uh, a, an act is made an offense, it is not an offense until it's made so. In the same vein, an, a crime is not given a retrospective effect. A law is not given a retrospective effect. So if a law is made today prescribing a crime, any act done prior to the coming into effect of that law cannot be deemed to be an offense because the, the act making that law, making that act an offense is only taking effect on the day it is made. I hope we understand. Now, what are the classes of crimes that we have? Under English law, we have two um, broad categories of crimes. We have the common law offenses and we have the statutory offenses. But as far as Nigeria is concerned, all crimes are statutory. And that, that will take us back to what I said earlier on, that it, an act can only become a crime when it is provided for by a law. By law, we mean statutes. Now, there are varying classes of crime and they're usually made for the sake of convenience. There could be the division along the, um, along the line of crime against the person, crime against property, and crime against the state. There are also divisions along, according to the gravity of the offense, the simple offenses, the misdemeanor, and the felonies. Now we would use the second category about the gravity of the offense for the purpose of this webinar. Now, we have three categories of offenses in this regard. We have the simple offenses. The simple offenses are offenses not considered serious, e.g. traffic offenses, or offenses of, of an environmental nature. If, for instance, the Kuala State government declares that um, every last Saturday of the month is an environmental sanitation day, and you have, you are, there's a coffee, you are forbidden from moving between the hours of seven and 10 in the morning. If, if you are caught moving between those hours, what, now, it is not a grievous offense and you have it. The next category of offenses are the ones we call the misdemeanors. These are offenses that are, punish, they are punishable within six months, but not up to three years imprisonment. It's a less serious offense. And, it's, and um, such um, offenses include um, criminal defamation, includes um, injurious falsehood, amongst others. Criminal defamation, for instance, I have said something criminally defamatory of the school. The school can um, take up a case of criminal defamation against me. The punishment is usually between six months and three years. Such offenses are called misdemeanors. They are not in the category of the totally serious offenses as we have them. Now, the third category are felonies. And these are the very, very serious offenses that are punishable with three years imprisonment or more. 
some could even be punishable by death. The reason why I've made this, this, this division along these lines is also underscore the fact that in as much as we have informal ways of social control, we have to put at the back of our minds that informal ways of social control could be limited. I will come back to this, but let me just ask a question so that we all come to terms with this. Informal ways of social control might not be able to um, control certain degree of offenses, might not be able to control certain um, elements of offenses, e.g. murder, but we'll get there along the line. Now, why do we need to punish offenders? Or why do we need to ensure that there is social control? Why? All over the world, there are five major justifications for criminal punishment. There are five major justifications all over the world. There are five reasons why we need to punish an offender. We have to note that take, taking us back to the era of John Locke and Thomas Hobbes. Thomas Hobbes said, without the government, life was short, nasty, brutish. I don't know in which order he made that description. But now, why are we having the government in place? The government is coming to say, okay, we should punish, there, are, there should be punishments for criminal, there should be, there should be justifications for criminal punishment. Why do we think um, the government has come to punish people? Number one is retribution. The third one is incapacitation. The third one is deterrence. The fourth one is rehabilitation. And the fifth one is reparation. These are the five major justifications for criminal punishment and for social control all over the world. Now, what is retribution? Retribution is the oldest justification in the book. It is similar to the eye for an eye theory as uh, the law of Moses says. Somebody has committed an offense, he should be punished for the offense he has committed. Eye for an eye. It is usually synonymous to the Sharia law as we have it in some states or Islamic law. If someone has stolen, Sharia law will say maybe his right hand should be cut off for stealing. So that is the oldest justification for um, for criminal offenses in the, in the book. It, 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 it proceeds on the assumption that anybody who is convicted of a wrongdoing deserves to be punished. And only those who are convicted of such wrongdoing sh should deserve punishment. The implication is that the this, this severity of the punishment should not be less than the gravity of the crime. If someone has committed an offense, it should be, it should be punished for that offense. I was fortunate to see a case. It will have a case in the learning. This person, Daniel Gia, I think it's in the next slide. Daniel Gia had gone to a shop at um, Yoruba Road in the Loring. It's a, it's a very popular market in Loring. He had gone to a shop and uh, we had um, robbed the shop owner of a pack of Lacassera and uh, 6,000 Naira. He had robbed the shop owner of a pack of Lacassera and 6,000 Naira. I don't know the market value of a pack of Lacassera. I want to assume it is not more than 3,000 Naira. So invariably, he has robbed the shop owner of 9,000 Naira. Now, when he got to court, the position was able to establish that he robbed the shop owner with a local gun. Now, this local gun had no bullets in it, but he robbed the shop owner with a local gun. So the question the court had to ask was, as at the time he was pointing the gun at, at the time he was pointing the gun at the shop owner, was the shop owner in a position to know that the gun did not have bullets? So once the court found out that the shop owner was not in a position to know whether the gun had bullets or not, the court now convicted this Danegia to death, to, um, to death by hanging. Now, if you equate um, the, the, the offense he has committed, the, the, what he has stolen, perhaps he was hungry, needed money, perhaps he needed to pay school fees for his children. And he took a, an, an unloaded gun. He went to rob the woman. He took um, like a, a pack of lacassera and 6,000 naira. Yet the court convicted him and sentenced him to death by hanging. And the conviction has just recently been affirmed by the Supreme Court. That is a very clear case of retribution in Nigeria. He had committed an offense, irrespective of the reasons why he had committed the offense, irrespective of 
the ways by which you have committed the offense, you are punished. That is what retribution connotes. Now, so it is usually criticized for being harsh. You and I will agree that co considering the extent of the offense she has, uh, the person has committed, is usually it is it is harsh if you are sentencing the person to death by hanging. I also give another example. It's a very popular case. It is called uh, Musa Sadao against the state. This woman woke up one day. This woman, she was married to a man, and they had um, three children. In their matrimonial home, the man came up, which is um, um, which is um, mistress came to the house and brought the mistress to the house. He told the woman to leave the matrimonial bed. The woman left the matrimonial bed, and uh, he said he wanted he, he brought the mistress home. He even told the woman to cook for the mistress, which the woman did. So the woman went out. She began to think about it. She began to think and think about it, and she felt very bad. So what she did was she took out her children and set the house ablaze, setting the house ablaze with the man and the mistress. Now she was she was brought to court, and the trial court, the high court, sentenced her to death by hanging, irrespective of the justification. No crime is justifiable anywhere in the world. You can't justify any crime. But if you look at it from this angle, this is a woman who, whose husband has brought home a mistress. He has even gone on to tell her to cook for the mistress. Now, at the end of the day, the Supreme Court set aside the, um, the punishment, but converted it, converted it to manslaughter, making that go to a prison for life as against death by hanging. What is the difference, life imprisonment or death by hanging? Now, the point I'm trying to make here is that the retribution principle, the, the justification of retribution does not take into consideration um, the, the reasons for the crime. It is just ash. And it is premised on the belief that individuals are rational beings and crime is um, irrational decision. Uh, I was moved by the devil to do this. I really did not mean to do it. And not um, defenses when retribution comes to play. The next one is incapacitation. It is premised on the theory that there's a duty on the state to protect the public from future wrongs. It is premised on that theory that the, the state has to protect the public from future wrongs. And how do you do that? If Mr. A has committed an offense, the government will feel that the only way to, to protect the public from the menace of Mr. A is to incapacitate him, either by incarceration or by killing him. When Evans, the notorious kidnapper, was imprisoned by the government, it was premised on, it was premised on the idea that the only way from protecting the public from, him, from that particular Mr. Evans is to incarcerate him or by putting him behind bars. So it disables or restricts the liberty of the offender, either by killing him or putting him behind bars. And it is, I have given the examples that when I was in imprisonment and um, curfew. So it is usually criticized for not affording the offender a second chance. And it's usually criticized for punishing individuals for crimes they have not committed. The idea is this, Mr. A has robbed Mr. Sheye and he's been punished. He's been put, uh, he's, been, he's been in prison because the, the government believes that putting him in prison will at least would be able to stop him from going on to um, rob Mr. Jakaye. The question we would ask is, has he robbed Mr. Jakaye? No, but because he has robbed Mr. Sheye, the government is saying putting him in prison would stop him from robbing Mr. Jakaye. So that's why it has been criticized for punishing individuals for crimes not yet committed. So it is the commonest form of justification used in Nigeria. Now, deterrence, that's the next one. It seeks to deter future offenders. It's more like scapegoatism. By the time I make Mr. A the scapegoat, by the time I use him as a scapegoat, I punish him adequately for the offense, it will not only deter Mr. A from going further to commit that, another offense of a similar nature, but for persons of Mr. A's ill, persons who see Mr. A or who are his peer group, they will see that ah, Mr. A having been punished this much, I, I don't think I should commit this offense because if Mr. A was punished this much, I would be punished. That's why the government, in its wisdom, made the death penalty the punishment for kidnapping and terrorism. 
And the idea is to deter future offenders. That by the time one or two persons are killed by hanging or are sentenced to death by hanging for kidnapping, for similar offenses, it will deter future offenders from committing that same crime. Whether this has been effective in practice, in reality, remains to be seen, but we'll get there. Now, it is premised on the logic that imposing criminal punishment will deter other people from committing crimes. Whether that is correct, we will get there. So the pain of punishment and the cost of imposing the pain are outweighed by the benefits to be enjoyed. The idea behind this is when you put, when you inflict pain of punishment on someone, the fact that that person is being punished and it would also serve as a deterrence to others. So when the government is spending so, so, so amount of money on you, on punishing Mr. A, the government is thinking that, yes, I would like to spend this amount of money on Mr. A, so that it will deter Mr. B and uh, Mr. B to Z from committing the same offense. So the idea is punishing Mr. A this much, spending a lot on Mr. A this much, it would only deter Mr. B to Z from committing the same offense. It's a common joke in the, in, um, in, in, among legal circles that when you go to the prison, you, are, you have free accommodation from the government, you have free food from the government, you have free transport to court from the government. But the reality is this, are these things are, are these things really enjoyable? So in as much as the government um, pays for feeding of inmates, prison inmates, pays for their transport, I'm aware that billions of Naira have been committed into correctional services. But the point is this, are these things enjoyable? The government knows that it is better for it to pay this much to punish the would-be offenders. That is the idea. But the example I would give, the fact that ESCC goes every day to tell people that, okay, we have committed 40 or so in first time, has it precluded or the bad other persons from wanting to commit the same offense? All the persons we have, uh, the Nigerian government are sentenced to death by hanging, all the kidnappers that they have arrested and all, has it stopped, has it reduced the menace of kidnapping as we have seen it? So it is not effective. That is where we are going. It is not effective. It, it, it does not deter potential offenders. That's the truth. And the age, the age gap for, for offenders has reduced. It is alarming that we have boys or girls of between 15 and 19 committing offenses. I keep asking myself, a boy or 17 year old, who killed his girlfriend in, uh, in Ogun State because he wanted to use her head for money ritual? What has he seen in his life? What has he seen? What has he gone through that he wants to commit money ritual? So those are the those are the questions we need to ask ourselves. Kidnapping, all those things are sent us at the face, but there's another there's another monster growing with us that we don't seem to know. I don't know we, when we, we saw the second the, the recent secondary school um, case about an alleged rape, like I, the Priestland school, when a boy of a girl of 14 and a boy of 11 were committing a moral act. It only goes to show the extent of moral decadence we have in this country. So punishment does, does not really deter offenders. That is the truth. Now, rehabilitation, that's the next justification in the book. It is premised on the idea that punishment can reform future crimes by reforming the individual offender's behavior. The Nigerian government, quite um, foolishly, uh, went on to say they wanted to rehabil rehabilitate Boko Haram offenders, that uh, once they dropped out, the question we should ask ourselves is, has it um, reduced um, Boko Haram um, um, exploits in the country? Has it reduced the extent of kidnapping or banditry as we have it? When someone has killed hundreds of people and you think the best form of punishment is to rehabilitate, put them to schools. So rehabilitation could involve education, it could involve vocational studies, counseling. I know it is premised on the idea that um, criminal behavior is not a rational choice, but influenced by social, psychological difficulties and problems. Now, the question is this, how many criminal offenders, how many offenders do we want to rehabilitate? If we rehabilitate for kidnapping, rehabilitate for uh, terrorism, 
rehabilitate for armed robbery, rehabilitate for different degrees of offenders. How many offenders do we know, do we want to rehabilitate? Does rehabilitate not connote a pat on the back? So those are the questions we will ask ourselves, which will also show that this justification of punishment has also failed. Now, the next one is reparation. It is really applicable in international law. So I would not should be corrected with the individuals making amends to victims. Can you hear me, please? I think we are on the... Yes, sir, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. So this is premised on the idea that crime should be corrected with the individuals making amends to victims. Now, the closest form in Nigeria is restitution. But we have seen how that has been bastardized in Nigeria. I'll give you the, uh, the pension um, fraud scheme that happened in Nigeria when someone stole billions of Naira and he was asked to restitute uh, the Nigerian government to uh, a little below 2 million or so. Which will also go on to show that the idea of reparation is not workable as far as we have it in Nigeria because it will be abused. When you say restitution, it is easier for me to go to the government, steal 100 million or 100 billion, and be asked to restitute the government by paying 2 million naira. That would seem to be a good deal for everybody. And that's why it is subject to abuse. Now, let us now come to the end of the topic. The whole idea behind telling us about crimes and the justification of crime is to give us a background of how the formal ways of um, social control and fighting crimes have seemingly failed, how it has not helped us. The fact that we have prosecuted many offenders in Nigeria has not reduced the spate of crimes in the country. Before, in Nigeria, armed robbers were given um, fine squad execution. They did reduce the spate of armed robbery. For our mothers and daddies here, my uh, device has a would be, she, she was alive then, she would have, she, she would be in a better position to answer us whether the fact that people were being execu executed stopped the crimes that were happening back then. Now, if the former ways of social control and fighting crimes have failed, it will now take us to the informal ways of fighting crime or of social control, because we cannot leave the society the way it is. That is the truth. I personally am in my 30s, but I fear for the future of this country. I fear for the future of this country because the bad children of nowadays are going to become parents. And in law, it is said that never does code on a bet. You cannot give what you don't have. So if I don't have good manners, it is difficult for me to pass good manners to my children. And we all know that what we have nowadays are ill-mannered people all over. So ill-mannered people will get married, ill-mannered people will give birth to children, and those ill-mannered people, uh, children will also become worse off because they saw their parents indulging in different social vices. And we can't also rule out the, the impact of the social media. That is why divorce is rampant. Just last week in my office, I had like almost eight people who came to me saying they wanted to get out of their marriages. That is the influence of social media. That's the influence of different things happening around us. Now, the informal ways of social control and fighting crimes is premised on the idea that crimes strive and cluster in places characterized by adverse conditions, neighborhood problems, and disadvantages. Most of us, most crimes, most persons that commit crimes are victims of peer pressure. They are victims of uh, ill manners. They are victims of not being properly trained. I have seen in this country, in this country where uh, young adults commit crimes because their parents asked them to. I saw a case recently, very recently. A person went to steal because he needed to give his mother money. So that is the extent at which we are. It resonates around the idea that local communities can solve common problems and in turn realize common goals. So that thing can be two linked. Number one, how can we solve the problems that we are in? Because we are in a mess as far as one is concerned. Insecurity and different, or different levels of crime at different levels. That is one. On the other hand, how can we prevent 
crimes from happening in the future. How can we curb these menaces in the board? So the informal ways of social control seeks to understand crime patterns and appreciates the effect of the society on crimes. It seems to appreciate the effects of the society on crimes. Now, how do we appreciate, how do we solve this menace? That is what the informal way is talking about. Now, which will take me back to where I started. I have analyzed the three categories of crimes that we have. We have felonies, we have misdemeanors, and we have um, uh, uh, the simple offenses. I dare say, I know the sociologists might, um, might contradict me here. I dare say that perhaps the only category of crime that can be effectively solved by the informal way are the simple offenses, and at best, the misdemeanors. They are the simple offenses, and at best, the misdemeanors. I imagine a local chief trying to solve a case of kidnapping. I imagine a local chief trying to solve a case of um, armed robbery. The extent at which they can go is ensure that these things do not come to play. But as soon as they come to play, as soon as they come into effect, the, 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 the limit of the informal ways of social control, with due respect, would be limited to simple offenses and misdemeanors. That is the honest truth. I'll give an example. We have kidnapping, we have, um, uh, we have um, um, armed robbery on the rise, we have um, banditry on the rise. Now, how do we curb these things using the informal ways? At best, we can stop for future occurrences, perhaps in the future. But the ones that we have on ground, how do we solve the immediate problems? Can we make use of local chiefs when even local chiefs are even victims of kidnapping? Do you understand the, the, the point I'm trying to make? The point I'm trying to make is this. There are capital, when we talk about this capital offense, there are some offenses that are perhaps outside the guard of the uh, informal ways of social control. But we'll still get there. Okay. So I said the informal social control involves an individual internalizing norms and values in the process of um, socialization that, okay, I'm supposed to live life this way. I'm supposed to do this this way. I'm supposed to live life this way. But then when we talk about um, the informal way of um, social control in this instance, we have to look at it from the point that a crime must not have been committed, a serious crime must not have been committed from the initial point. Because if a crime has been committed, it will take it outside um, the gap of the informal way of social control. Now, customs, norms, and moral values. We have to understand the fact that they produce social values present in individuals. But customs, the norms, and moral values, they vary from locality to another. I'll give an example. In Benin, for instance, in Benin, for instance, uh, the house of the father that he lived in his lifetime can only be narrated by the first male son. Can only be narrated by the first male son. So let's assume the first male son is um, the first male, sorry, or the first son of the family is um, the twelfth born, and he has 11, uh, 11 sisters ahead of him. He is the one that can inherit that property. Now, let me give an example. Like, what I'm trying to say is, is that moralities, customs, and norms, they vary from locality to the other. What could be morally right in Ilori, or what could be morally right in Omaro might be morally wrong in, um, in Ibos. I'll give an example of the Osu caste system. So trying to combat crimes based on the informal um, ways of combat, or informal ways of social control might make it subjective might make the results very, very subjective. It would mean that the way a particular crime or offense would be combated or would be dealt with in Southeast will be different from the way to be combated or dealt with in the Northwest. 
And that will bring to our laws inconsistency. inconsistency. Now, these informal factions, which I have mentioned in, the, in this slide, which I said include shame, ridicule, criticism, disapproval, and um, discrimination, amongst others. I am not sure how these informal ways can combat the crime of kidnapping. If a kidnapper is ridiculed, how does it stop him from, doing, from kidnapping? So I would suggest that in as much as the formal ways of social control have failed quite glaringly, the informal way should not be seen as um, is an alternative, as a substitute for a formal control. They have to be complementary of each other. They have to be complementary of each other. So we should not see the informal ways and informal ways of social control as a viable alternative, as an alternative, alternative rather, to the formal ways. They have to complement each other to achieve the Nigeria of our dreams. Now, I said, um, I think I've talked about this. I said, um, the impact of informal means of social control on felonies remains to be seen. Um, prisons are overcrowded. So there is, of course, the need to adapt informal social uh, ways of, informal ways of social control to complement the formal ways of social control. Not all offenses in Nigeria should be made punishable by imprisonment. We are just in a funny country that um, community service and other offenses are not given um, due credence. In advanced, in advanced countries, in advanced countries, there are some offenses you commit that are not punishable with imprisonment. But in community service, you could um, be asked to sweep the streets for three months. You could be asked to do different things for three months. But in Nigeria, everything is prison. Varying degrees of um, imprisonment and times from three months to 30 years, to 40 years, to life imprisonment. To life imprisonment. So there's a need for us to adapt the formal means of social control with the informal means of social control. Now, why do we need to make use of the informal means of social control? Number one, we have delay in justice delivery in Nigeria. I am doing a case in um, Ikunu. Presently, it's a land matter. It's not criminal, it's not a criminal case, it's a land matter. That case was filed in 1993. And I was still in primary school. Many lawyers have died in that case. Many judges have died. Are you with me, please? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes sir. So that is a classic example of the delay in justice delivery in Nigeria. Our courts are overcrowded. An average judge. In, in, in Quara State has over 300 cases to deal with at a particular time. In the same way, we have paucity of judicial workers. We have corruption and the system is overcrowded. Strikes and industrial actions of judicial workers. We, are, we should all be aware that sometime last year, for over six months, judicial workers were on strike. So if anybody slapped you in that period, there, there, there was no court you could go to. The police stations were overcrowded. I had somebody who came here and said that his neighbor slapped him and um, he wanted to go to court. He wanted to file this. He was going to spend any amount of money to ensure that he punished his neighbor. So when I told him that, okay, fine, we could do this. I was trying to ensure he said to He said, no, that that neighbor was fond of bullying him. He wanted to show him that he had a law on his side. I said, okay, your consultation fee is 100,000 naira for consulting a lawyer, then by the time we want to do the case itself, you pay 500,000 naira. The gentleman just put his hands on his cheek and said, for ordinary slap, which only goes to show that the justice, the judicial, the justice system in Nigeria is also very expensive. It's very costly. To find an average criminal, to, to, do an, to do an average criminal case in Nigeria involves money, involves time. We've, we've seen cases that will go on for many years. In Nigeria at the moment, I, I, I was looking at it, 70% of inmates in Nigerian prisons are awaiting trial. Their trials have not been concluded, 70%. The distinction between those awaiting trial and those who have been convicted are those who wear uniforms in prison and those who don't wear uniforms. 
Now, if you go to an average patient close to you, you will see that the number of those not wearing uniforms is more than times two of those wearing uniforms. And some patients have been there for years. So which goes to show that what the formal system has failed. But then it can't be replaced with the informal system. They have to be complementary of each other. There is sudden rise in the use of direct position of cases. People now prosecute cases themselves. If I want to deal with my neighbor for being rude to me, I could go to court, prosecute cases myself. We shows that we have so many cases. We only go to show that our courts are bombarded with cases. Security agencies are also not helping the matter. Even our spiritual organizations, thank God for our approach and say no, and the kind of system, the kind of integrity, the kind of system we have had in, we've known about him for long. Very recently, we saw a pastor who was traveling abroad and was, and was found with um, drugs at the airport, a pastor in the East. We've seen pastors who tolerate internet fraud, who tolerate all those things. So which goes to show that the formal system has to be complementary of the informal system. And the informal uh, control starts from the home because charity, as they say, begins at home. By the time you tolerate your child who is lying from small, small lies, it graduates to the bigger light. From the bigger light, it graduates to stealing. When, you're, when, when you give your child a, a biro to go to school, he comes back home with six other biros. And you feel okay because I did that to Emino uh, You are encouraged, the, the person will become a bigger thief. And that's where we have found ourselves. Nowadays, we see parents going to schools on a daily basis, complaining to teachers, why did you beat my child this way? Why people like me were growing up? Uh, my father never went to my school. Whatever beating you got in school, you will not even be able to say it at home because you know your father will beat you again. But nowadays, the children will go home, report to the parents, the parents will follow them, go to school. This is what we have found. So all the, 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 the social, uh, the, the, it's a system we all have to contribute to, to make things work. So I, I don't know the amount of time I have left, but then I, I, would, um, I, I don't believe in too much long talk because it gets boring. So I would um, conclude that um, the society cannot do without um, the informal means of social control. But it has to be complementary. We will only be making a mistake of trying to replace one with the other. So personalities as the traditional council, the local council, this should, uh, should take up the responsibility of ensuring safety of the subject. Should also ensure that um, they are well in charge. They are well in control of events happening around them. That would also help to, because the government has failed us, that's the truth. And, the gov and it's also true that the government is overwhelmed. The government has failed us. It could be as a result of deliberate failure or because it is overwhelmed. We have the varying degrees of crimes happening all over. So which goes to show that everybody, uh, district heads, professional heads, pastors, fathers, mothers, uh, lecturers, teachers, we all have to brace up and ensure that the information Normal means of social control, we effective normal means of control. I really thank you for the audience so far. I thank you for the opportunity given to me. I would be willing to field questions. I believe um, we should even concentrate more on answering questions than the whole lecture itself. So I'm willing to field questions as um, the webinar goes on. Thank you for having me, Saz and Nas. Thank, thank you very much. much. Barrister Thompson, Ulusheye, that was quite a robust and insightful presentation. A round of applause again. Keep on clapping for him. I believe we have learned quite a lot from that presentation. And we, it may surprise you to know, our dear guest facilitator, Barrister Ulusheye, that we are called for questions while the presentation was ongoing. And we have quite a number of questions here written. And I guess we also have persons here who want to ask questions, you know, on, I mean, verbally. 
If you have questions verbally, please let me see your hands up. Okay, number one. So we have two persons here. Okay, yes. So we'll take these two questions and then please, what I'll do is to read out these questions, first of all, so that it can, you know, take them together at once. After that, we'll now have questions for these two persons that will want to say their questions. Okay, so the first question say, thank you, Barista, for the lecture. My opinion is that even though we believe that formal means of social control cannot be employed independently, I think celerity of punishment is a major problem in Nigeria, in Nigeria justice system. Cases are left unattended to, and this spill over years, reducing the effects of punishment to deter future offender. Sir, how do you think the country can speed up the discharge of punishment so as to deter future offenders? Don't you think the delay in um, pronouncing justice could be the reason for ineffective nature of, it, of the former means? That's question one. The next question says, crimes in Nigeria are enhanced based on the high level of unemployment in Nigeria. Okay. What should the government do about this? Number three question, how does the judiciary curb crimes in Nigeria when the judiciary is corrupt? Number four, it was mentioned earlier that the government is not justiciable or something like that. I can't really see it. Justifiable or something. In the court, meaning the citizens cannot force them to act right. So how then do you suggest these, how then do you suggest uh, issues to be tackled at the federal and national level if the government is not ready to act on these solutions? Number five, with the security challenges currently faced by Nigeria, is it possible to combine both formal and informal means of social control? Next question says, thank you, sir, for the presentation. What do you have to say about sending someone on exile as a punishment to criminal of offense. Is it not the same as imprisonment, especially when it serves as deterrent to prevent or reduce crime in the society? Next, we have, everyone seems to have a solution in mind on the issue of insecurity, but no one is doing anything. It feels like a waste of time if the changes aren't visible. This seems like a contribution to me. Then we have a question online. I will take that before we now have those that will speak to us on the question. That was a brilliant presentation, sir. Please, my, my question is that, how do we deal with the political interference in the informal social control, e.g. the place of the government taking major decision in the appointment of traditional rulers? Those are the recent questions that we have. So we call on the uh, two persons to ask questions. We'll first call on Mr. Oweye Binga for his question, please. This will be followed by Dr. Ifejika. Thank you, Ma. I want to appreciate once again this afternoon. Yes, the presenter for that wonderful presentation. And before I will ask my question this afternoon, there's an observation that I want to make. And I want to believe that this program, they, they should be beneficiaries and not here, which is the student of political science and international relation. Because I just spoke with one of my colleagues here to quickly go outside there and invite some of them here. And that is why we are having a few number of them here, the online level student, please, Densa, and the HOD, the subsequent webinar like this, especially as it regards to the topic that you are addressing this day today, we have many. 
and importance to the student of political science and international relations. Um, this is my question this afternoon to the, to the presenter. Well, Nigeria is on a life support when it comes to the issue of security. And you mentioned something that the formal means of addressing the insecurity in Nigeria has been exhausted. Now, you also submitted, because I followed line by line, your presentation that both the formal and the informal means of addressing insecurity are complementary. But as a lawyer, you will agree with me that the issue of insecurity cannot be concluded without making reference to the Constitution. There's this ongoing debate in the National Assembly and among public, among opinion leaders and political leaders of the issue of state security, which I believe will go a long way to address all these security challenges in the country. You never, especially state police, you never mentioned that. And there are countries comparatively in the world today, especially India, Taiwan, Belgium, France, United States of America, even United Kingdom that have state police and they are doing well to secure their territory. And I want, this is the question, what is your take on the issue of state police in Nigeria? And also, how do you think that can be facilitated at the National Assembly? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take on Dr. Ifejika now. Thank you, uh, Barista, for that um, wonderful presentation. Um, while I agree with you with some of the things um, you said, I equally have some objections. And um, precisely, it's about your um, opinions or views on punishment. You said that punishment has never deterred uh, people from committing crimes. You know, that over the years, um, um, even when we had military regimes, we applied the um, capital punishment, whereby uh, uh, criminals were executed by uh, uh, mass shooting and all that. And yet, we are still having uh, issues of crimes here and there. And of course, on daily basis, it's increasing instead of decreasing. And I want to say that uh, on that point, uh, 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 you might not be completely right because we have contexts, societies like the entire Asia continent, Indonesia, for instance, when it comes to drug peddling and all that. You cannot compare the rate that which people peddle drugs from other parts of the world to Asia than the, the, the rate at which they peddle from other parts of the world to Europe and America because in the case of Indonesia, for, for instance, when you are caught, it is death, death sentence. Everybody knows a Nigerian was killed some years ago. In fact, a Nigerian of Ibo extraction was killed up, you know, some years ago for this issue. Now, what that simply means is that if not for that law in place, that route would have become, you know, uh, people would have been frequenting it, drug peddlers would have been frequenting it. You know, uh, and, and, and of course, they will know that the highest that will happen to them is when they are, you know, apprehended and imprisoned. But knowing fully well that when you are, you are caught, your life is at stake, one will be refrained. And that, my, that is the reason, certainly, why you don't have high rate of drug peddling along, along uh, in Europe, in, sorry, in Asia as a whole. A, 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 another point I will use to buttress this is, you know, when I was in the university as a student. One of our lecturers in philosophy department who was teaching us ethics told us something. And that, you know, uh, that also uh, relates to what you said about military regime and all that. He said that when they were yo younger, that the when they were very young, that their, their, their father took them to uh, 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 where uh, 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 um, criminals were massacred, were killed by mass shooting. And the father did that to give them the opportunity to see what it, you know, it, it, it looks like you know, to be caught when you have committed, to be, to be caught in committing a particular crime. He said that 
the father made sure that was, that was in Ibadan. The father made sure that he took them to you know uh, uh, those occasions for them to see. And the way they saw the way those people were, were, were shot and they, they died. For that reason, fear you know came into their heart. So they never thought of you know uh, uh, venturing into crimes. Can you see that even at that level? You know, it, it, it might not be society itself is a complex, is a complex, complex, uh, 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 it's complex in its nature as human beings that are, as well as human beings that are living in it. So you know how you know you make a law stringent that human beings will not commit, will not, will not contravene it. But the, what, what, what what should be looking after is at what rate is that is those contraventions taking place? Is it less? Is it at the middle point or is it high? That is one. Um, so, so uh, on, on the basis of all what I've said, I'm, I'm, I'm dislodging that argument that, um, you know, that um, uh, 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 punishment has never deterred people from crime. It, it does. The only thing is that, you know, we might not be able to measure it accurately. That is it. Second, secondly, I agree with you uh, with the fact that um, uh, 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 rehabilitations have been going on. I think you are talking about the fact that the government has made efforts to rehabilitate Boko Haram and the rest of them. But yet, crime is still, going, is still going on. But I want to say that some of these practices we have today, you know, are borrowed practices. In our, our own society, Africa is, 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 is extremely complex. And the nature of Africans themselves, too, also contribute in making, in following most of these effort, efforts that have been made towards rehabilitating criminals. In, in Europe, if a white man tells you he's laying down arms, he's laying down arms. In most cases, the reason they are taking up arms against the state, you know, is, it might not be because of economic situations, might not be because of unemployment. Some of them might have some, some personal grievances against government, and therefore they will take up arms. So, so when, when eventually, eventually there is a bargain a negotiation between them and government, they will lay down arms. And once they, once they, once they, once they do that, they have done it forever. But in, but in, in Africa, we have complex, you know, in fact, a vast array of issues that may be to go into crime. And if, for that reason, it, it becomes difficult for you to actually say that any, you know, uh, 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 um, um, effort towards getting them off the crime will produce the results because they are, you know, most of them cannot even tell you, you know, uh, precisely what is making them to commit. Some of them have a, a, a number of reasons that the government cannot address. So it is possible that when they are given amnesty or whatever, they will still have to go back to those crimes because, you know, of the complex issues that are pushing them into crime. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, sir. We have one more question and it's online. I'll just read that to us. In every society, there is a dichotomy between morality and legality. And in the case of Nigeria, the Senate has just criminalized ransom payments to kidnappers. What is your take on this, even when we know that government has failed in its responsibility of protecting life and property? The ineffectiveness of informal security outfits, is this an issue of legality or incompetence? So there we are. Barista, over to you. Quite a handful, you say. You're all now. You're all now, sir. Okay, sorry. I, I was unmuted. I was not. I was muted before. I appreciate the interventions. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, so, but, but I'll address the issues in no particular order. I would. Uh, I would address them in no particular order. I would like to start with um, um, the doctor that spoke um, before the last question was read, and um, um, perhaps I think it's a matter of opinion. Uh, if I think um, deterrence, um, punishment has not really deterred crime, and he thinks it has um, really deterred in some places, it's a matter of opinion. But maybe I was taken out of context. The point I was trying to make is that um, punishment has not really totally deterred crime. And I'll give my examples. If punishment, is actually the examples of um, Asia, I, is the doctor meaning to say that in Asia today, 
persons don't still attempt to peddle drugs. If that was the point the doctor was trying to make, then the allusion he made to the example that happened last year would not have a reason. Because way back, persons who have been peddling crime, uh, peddling drugs in Asia have been punished by um, sent being sentenced to death. I think we need to understand the peculiarities of the modern society. Perhaps we do mod um, um, if you don't understand this point, we would appreciate the persons we are dealing with. I see myself as being in the middle of an adult and a young person. So I could call myself a young adult. An average youth these days, if it is told that you don't do this thing, because if you, if you do this thing, this thing will happen to you, that is when he even sees the impetus to want to do it. The average youth these days want to, wants to dare you to do what you would do. So it's a matter of opinion. And um, the idea that um, certain things have been done, if we, be, if we do stringent, um, what's it called, punishment for certain offenses, I honestly believe it would not deter the crimes as much as we want. The questions we need to ask ourselves is, while the person is being punished for the supposed crimes, you have to, you have to understand the fact that they are, even in, each, in advanced countries, there are cases where people are wrongly punished for crimes they have not been, they are not, they have not even committed. Now the point I'm trying to make is this: the fact that Asia or some countries they punish individuals for um, for uh, for drug trafficking. Are you saying they have not been selective in the punishment they have been dishing out? Are we saying that has really deterred uh, the extent at which people have been punished in those countries? So it's a matter of opinion. If, for instance, you think okay, um, going through the full extent of the law. Would deter offenders. I honestly believe it would not deter offenders to the extent. I gave you the example of someone who was in prison. He was in prison from 1991 and he lived prison until 2014. As a matter of fact, he became the head of the Muslims in the prison. He was one who was calling others for prayer. As soon as he left uh, prison, he went on to commit another crime. I don't want us to restrict the idea of punishment. To being, to, to being killed. If you send someone to prison, perhaps if the if we are maybe we are restricting it to death penalty, yes, death penalty could deter the particular person that committed the offense. But would it automatically deter others? No. Would punishment, prison term, deter others? No. Would it even deter the person who has committed the offense? The answer might not be might not be true. Because someone has committed an offense, did over 15 years in prison, and has still come back to commit another offense. Perhaps we don't even see how these people relate in prison. When people go to prison, they see themselves as like minds. They talk, they talk about how criminal gangs are even formed in prison. Worse gangs are formed in prison. So are you not trying to say that putting them in prison will deter them from going out there to commit another crime? So it's a matter of opinion, the learned doctor, sir. That is one. Then um, uh, someone also talked about um, the fact that I said um, the formal and informal means are complementary and that um, the issue of state security. Now, I like the fact that you made allusions to other countries. I, I think you made allusions to Taiwan and some other countries, but we have to understand the fact that Nigeria is a peculiar state. We are an heterogeneous state. That is why Iberian Wambani said Nigeria is a British invention. We are admitted, we are, we, are in, we are an heterogeneous state. Now, I honestly believe, a matter of opinion, that we would be worse off with state security. And I'll give my examples. Now, we all know how the machineries of the police and the army are being used for political reasons. Now let's give an example. If I become governor of this state someday, and um, the pol automatically I'll be in charge of the police because the, state, the police would be answerable to me. And uh, my learned doctor who asked the question seems to be is my political opponent. What do I do? I first uh, uh, take up, take away all the security um, um, personnel. I first begin to use them against him. So in as much as we look at the pros of certain ideas, we also need to look at the cons. The idea of um, having a federal police system, having a federal security system, is to remove the police from the nuances of regionalism is to remove uh, the security um, architecture of the country from the politicization which has bedeviled us in this country. 
An average, imagine if you are driving, you are in Quara, you have to deal with the Quara police. You go to Osho State, you deal with the Osho State police, different police um, structures, different police architecture. I am not sure state policing is really the answer to the problems we face in this country. We could have complementary outfits, like we have in the Southwest that we have the Amotekuns and the Vigilante. We could have complementary outfits, but removing the security, um, um, the security, uh, whatever, from the federal government and putting it in the hands of the state, it's a time bomb waiting to explode. My own opinion, it's a matter of opinion, we could be divergent about it. And that's the beauty of law and um, social issues. Now, um, someone asked how we can speed up the discharge of punishment and um, the delay in pronouncing justice. Um, I would suggest that we have um, special courts. In the former military eras, we had special courts. We had a special court for failed bank. We had a failed bank, bank tribunal. We had special courts. Just as we have special courts in Nigeria for election petitions, nothing precludes us from having special courts for armed robbery, special courts for treason. But if a judge is the one that does armed robbery, does a case of stealing, does a case of um, theft, does a ca different cases, the, such a judge could be overwhelmed. So I would advocate the need for us to have special courts with the aid of special courts and, prop, and uh, uh, proper persons manning those special courts. It will reduce um, the delay that we have in the justice system. That is one. Number two, the, uh, the, 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 the mechanism of um, getting justice too could be made more straightforward. In Nigeria, there's something we call the DPP's advice. The DPP is the director of public prosecution. Before any case is instituted in the court, after the police has done an investigation, it falls the file to the director of public prosecution. Sometimes that file could be there for three, four years while the person is languishing in prison awaiting trial. So by so by, by the time the DPP now wakes up and sees the file, because the DPP too is overwhelmed with different case files, crime is committed everywhere. Everywhere, as we are saying, as we are talking now, different crimes have been committed. So by the time the DPP uh, has to go through all the files, make a report whether the person should be prosecuted or not, that also takes time. So by the time we unbond um, 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 the DPP, we make the system so straightforward. Then I feel that we can also speed up the dispensation of justice and the discharge of punishment. Now in Nigeria, we also have to look at the fact that there's a presumption of innocence which is important. In all those countries that we were talking about, my denial doctor alluded to uh, maybe Asia, what they have in those countries are not basically presumption of innocence, but presumption of guilt as it were. It is not, it not beyond on you, once the person is arrested, it beyond on you to come and show that you are not guilty. But in Nigeria, the key system of practice, the law we practice is that even if you have found the drugs, the law still presumes you innocent until the government Found finds you guilty. That is the essence of section 36, sub 5 of the constitution. So by the time the law presumes you have, you have been caught with drugs, look at Abba Kari. I really don't want to give live examples, but I have to give this example. He was caught on tape uh, talking about drugs and everything. The law still presumes him innocent until he's um, proven otherwise. So if the prosecution fails in, in, the, in, the, in proving the guilt, of the accused person, no matter how sensational we all are about the case, the person will go on, will go with his life. So the idea of justice system in Nigeria is different from what we have all over the countries. Now, I agree that unemployment enhances crime. I totally agree, unemployment enhances crime. But we can't say that unemployment causes crime. It only enhances crime. It only enhances crime because if uh, if employment does not um, uh, uh, does not uh, does not uh, if, uh, if employment does not cause crime, those in employment would not be uh, would not be uh, committing crimes. I'm rounding up now. Now, how does judiciary curb crime when the judiciary is corrupt? I agree. We have corruption everywhere. Corruption has eaten deep into the uh, system of Nigeria, so it is difficult for the judiciary to uh, to combat crime when itself it is corrupt. So I agree with that. Then I talked about chapter two not being justiciable. The idea behind chapter two not being justiciable is that they are directive principles which guide the state. The government considers the fact that if they make those things justiciable in court of law, 
An average citizen will rush to court. I, I finished. I, I finished school two years ago. I've not gotten a job. So that's why they made those things not justiciable. That is the idea. They, they are not. The thing not being justiciable. Although there are some windows which you can use to make those things justiciable, but I'm not sure it is fit for the purpose of this webinar. You, maybe you have to consult me and pay consultation fees for that. So I think um, that is that. I think I have um, almost answered all the questions that I have here. At some point, my network went off. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Barrister. You have done justice to the question. And uh, you have indeed shown that you're you are not uh, a greenhorn in your area. A round of applause for him again. Thank you so very much. Next, we shall be taking the webinar appraisal as I invite the Dean, College of Business and Social Studies, Dr. Benkele. Social Sciences, what did I say, Studies? Sciences, pardon my play. All right, a round of applause for him as he comes forward. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you very much um, for correcting yourself in social studies or social sciences. The Barsons Law in absentia, I want to crave her indulgence to stand on the protocol that we're running with. Well, I, I would want to take us about two minutes to appraise this um, webinar. The barrister has done justice, like we have said, to this topic. And um, we have seen the veracity of how he has, um, you know, dissected this topic. The Historic validators know that um, the, issue, the challenges of crime in Nigeria is not only a reality, but it's also cosmopolitan. It is everywhere in this country. And um, also made to understand that government, the essence of government is to ensure the protection of life and property. Um, it took us through what crime is, took us through the class or classes of crime, talking about the common law offenses, the statutory law uh, offenses, and for that classify crime into simple misdemeanor and felonious. It took us into the justification of crime, I mean, justification of punishment, rather, talking about the five justification for punishment. Nine must be punished offenders. Talking about retribution, incapacitation, and others. Um, he asked a question, has all these forms of punishment helped to reduce crime? And indirectly told us that the answer is an emphatic no. That all these punishments have not succeeded in reducing crime in Nigeria significantly. Talk about the informal, uh, informal ways of shock control. And took us through some of those uh, factors that make crime to thrive. And um, But at least he make very important statement that informal ways of shock control cannot be substituted to the formal ways. It can only be complementary. It can only complement. And um, finally, it took us uh, give, us, give us some highlight why we need informal social controls. Mention some of them as delays in justice delivery, the paucity of judicial workers, strikes, rise in the use of um, 
uh, direct persecution, no, persecution and all of that, concluded by saying or reiterating what I said earlier. The society cannot do without a informal means of social control. The traditional rulers need it. What is that in my village? When we're growing up in primary school and secondary school, when somebody commits a crime of say stealing, you will bring all your age grades naked you, pour you ashes and water. You start dancing you know, in, the, in the town. Nobody will tell you to commit that crime again. So it went a long way to deter every other person who won't have the intention of committing that same crime. So he go to a deter. But what I, just like he said, you are not succeeded in reducing crime significantly. Because even when people are seeing others being killed in armed for arm robbery, public execution, even that same day, there will be arm robbery, arm robbery operation. That's the same day. So I think that's what he's saying. Once, Once again, again Barista um, Oluwashi, I hope I'm correct. I want to appreciate you immensely. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you very much for that uh, good job you have done on the webinar, Professor Sir. That was the Dean College of Business and Social Sciences. I'm not going to make that mistake in case you're looking out for it. All right. So now we're going to take the vote of thanks by no other person than the HOD, Political Science, International Relations, and Mass Communication. And no person, Dr. Mojupe Ake, please a round of applause for her as she comes forward. Keep on clapping, celebrate our students who are here. Thank, Thank you very much. much. You're most welcome. Thank you very much, ma. Uh, -E. On behalf of the College of Business and Social Sciences, specifically the Department of Political Science, International Relations and Mass Communication, uh, we want to first appreciate God uh, for the success of today's program. To our speaker, Barista Oluwashe Adeboye, we want to appreciate you for your presentation. Uh, it is very, very educative and impactful. The topic, like you agree with us at the beginning of the program, that it is apps. Uh, this, your presentation also, has for us up and giving us a leeway for further research because we realize that this is something we cannot run away from. Looking at the security challenges we are facing presently in the country. I also want to appreciate the Vice Chancellor, Professor Charity Aremudo in absentia, the Registrar, Ms. Fola Onyeluye for their time. Our Dean, we appreciate you, sir, for your time. I will have some eminent scholars online. Uh, we have uh, Professor J.A. E. Adewale from Lautek Ubumosho. Sir, we appreciate you and want to thank you for being part of this. We have other eminent personalities, scholars online. We appreciate you all for being part of our program. Our professors, Deans of colleges, head of departments, faculty, staff, and students present here. We appreciate you all for your presence. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Ma. We give God all the glory. We started with an opening prayer, and then we're going to close this program with a closing prayer, which will be said by Mrs. Jubilee Akpalowo. Please endeavor to wait after the closing prayer for a good photograph outside. Thank you very much. Did that, should I echo that? No, I will not echo it. Don't worry. 
Thank you. May we please rise as we take the closing prayer. Heavenly Father, we are grateful unto you for today. Thank you for the help we have received. Thank you from start to finish. Thank you for knowledge shared, dispensed, gained. We say be exalted in Jesus' name. Thank you for all the facilitators. Thank you for wisdom. Thank you for efficiency. Thank you for expertise. Thank you for the students. Thank you for everyone here. Calmness, decorum, be exalted in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for help for all the stakeholders. Here are issues raised. We ask for help for Nigeria. Please send help to us in Jesus' name. And help us to do what we ought to do. Thank you, Father, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.